Hi friends, it's Angie. It's scary coming back on camera after quite an absence and quite a lot of drama. I've got lots to tell you, but rather than rambling for an hour, I'm going to make a few short videos. So the most pressing one is a call to Stephen Donnelly, the Minister for Health in Ireland, uh, to conduct an urgent audit of Cavan General Hospital in County Cavan in the Midlands of Ireland. Um, uh, it's like a war zone. I felt like a, a, a war correspondent. Um, I was taken by ambulance on Friday by two amazing ambulance drivers who are worthy of awards, Eamon and Colin, absolutely wonderful. And uh, I was in the midst of uh, probably a quadruple emergency um, as a child abuse survivor and uh, a survivor of no consent medical experiments since infancy or in utero, I am diagnosed with something called dissociative identity disorder. And I've had a lot of treatment for it. Unfortunately, I had to get it from America because although psychiatric services in me have agreed, at first they diagnosed me with borderline personality disorder due to unresolved childhood trauma. Um, and then it was refined to DID, but they informed me that there's nowhere in Ireland caters for that. So I accessed um, six months treatment uh, online from America and stayed ongoingly in a support group. So I I've done a huge amount of work on resolving that and mostly don't dissociate majorly. I can switch a little bit, but nothing dramatic unless there's a major trauma in my life. So about every 10 years, if I'm under severe stress, I will um, either become mute or uh, terrified of men and not able to have people come in my space. And if I'm not mute, I'll stammer. So quite a mess. Uh, you know, quite in quite distress. And for anybody, even uh, health professionals, if they don't understand, they don't know why I'm carrying in a corner or lying in a fetal position or um, talking in a childlike voice, they don't understand it. So that's something maybe, you know, it could, could be introduced, but that's not my point. So these wonderful ambulance drivers, one of them had actually heard of DID, Eamon, and was wonderful. He spent a good half an hour in the house. They both sat down because I was too intimidated to talk to them standing up, happened towering above me. And they both patiently listened. And one of them spoke to a very understanding doctor, Virginia, Gillian Begley, who also understands a lot. She's not necessarily trained in DID, but she's very highly trained in child sexual abuse trauma. So, so that was the nervous breakdown side of things. Um, something that goes along, and there's a connection here, and, it, and if, if the governments would learn this, they would save an awful lot of money in both the prison service and the health service. Something that goes along with childhood trauma is addiction. And so, both my mother uh, and one, at least one of my sisters and myself have wrestled most of our lives with uh, alcohol. Um, and my mother was also addicted to liberal and Valium for a while because they tried to just medicate her out of her um, trauma instead of dealing with it. So I, I had a relapse. I hit the bottle pretty hard and I had a breakdown. I also have injuries, which interestingly were sustained in some part, in, in quite, a, quite a great part at Cabin General Hospital in 2014, when they administered a drug called ciprofloxacin, um, which is banned in America and restricted in Ireland. And it was administered to me when I had two tumours and a cyst and it was looking like cancer. Um, so the, the consultant deemed it appropriate to administer three antibiotics at the same time 
intravenously, including ciprofloxacin. And predictably, the reason it was banned in America and restricted in Ireland is because vast numbers of people, it, it damages the Achilles tendon and it restricts the fluid on the joints and causes chronic weakness in the joints and arthritis. So predictably, I broke my ankle, I twisted my knee, I've torn my rotator cuff and all my joints, I, I literally turned into an old lady overnight having never broken a bone in my body and having, you know, I was a, a fitness junkie. I'd done abseiling, I'd done parachute jumping, I'd done tyrolean tra traverse, I'd done ballet. You know, I'd been active all my life, so I'm now a cripple. So, and then I have osteoarthritis in the base of my spine and my neck. So the ambulance drivers were wonderful and they phoned ahead and said, She's not able to sit for long periods of time and she's in a highly distraught mental state as well as needing to detox medically from alcohol because I'd nearly died. Alcohol is a progressive disease and each time you relapse, it's, it gets a bit worse. And when I tried to stop on my own last about a week ago, um, the detox was so horrendous. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say for about two to three days I was on death's door. Um, I won't go into the gory details, but some say that's how Amy Winehurst died, that she quit on her own and had three weeks without drinking and then she went on a binge and died. I don't know if that's the truth. Let's get back to Cabin Journal. So the ambulance drivers and the GP both said she needs a bed when she arrives, both for mental health reasons and physical reasons. She can't sit for long periods of time and she's very, she's in a heightened state of um, trauma. So it, got, it went well, the ambulance drivers took me to Cabin General and they very kindly kept me in the ambulance safe until I could go straight to triage. So you could wait in the cabin for up to five hours to even get triaged. So they bypassed that very kindly. They kept me in the ambulance, I don't know, half an hour, an hour, and I went straight into triage. And that's when things started to go wrong. The triage nurse sat me on a chair. She came right in my face, at which point I panicked, but the ambulance driver was still there. And so he explained to her, can you step back a little bit, please? And she treated me like a drunk that needed to dry out. And may I say, a GP not too far from here used to go to St John God's once a year to dry out. There's no shame in addiction, even though there's stigma in both addiction and mental health. So she decided, oh, she said to me, um, oh, sorry, the, 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 the detox specialist only works Monday to Friday. And this was Friday, six o'clock. And she, and she said he left at five. So I said, I'm awfully sorry that I didn't time my breakdown convenient to his schedule. So she said, oh, well, we'll get you seen. And she gave me some Librium, which is part of detox. Librium, potassium, B12, vitamin C, thiamine, and regular food and supervision, uh, usually three to five days. But she didn't know any of that and the specialist wasn't there so she gave me four or six librium and she said somebody will check on you every two hours and then insisted i then go and sit in a public corridor which terrified me but i did and i just said would it be okay to have a please a trolley i can lie in the fetal position cover my face with a blanket and just, I can just wait any amount of time if you just can facilitate that, please. She said to me, there are no trolleys and therefore emergencies. And I said, this is an emergency. I wouldn't be here otherwise. She said, no, they're for like elderly people with heart attacks. So I said, not every emergency needs to look like an elderly person having a heart attack. So I went to the public corridor, 
which is hilarious because people were social distanced horizontally, but the corridor is so narrow that people walk up and down, up and down, up and down. They can touch your feet, so it's just a joke. Uh, uh, it's just a joke. But at, lo and behold, at the end of this um, public corridor was a, a, an unused trolley. So I walked back and said, there actually is a trolley at the end of the corridor you've just sent me into. Would it be okay if I just lie on that? She said, no, it's for emergencies. She wasn't getting it at all. She didn't hear anything I said, really. She just saw alcohol detox and judged me. And she then called security. Because I said to her, if I, I, I promise you, if I can't lie flat, I will end up in a fetal position on the floor. She called security and she instructed them, if this patient either lies on the floor or so much as goes near that trolley, you are to call the guardie and have her removed from the hospital. 10 hours I sat in that uh, corridor. Some people waited 15 hours to be seen. It was like a, a war zone. Uh, I sat as like, a kind security guard gave me a wheelchair, thought it might be marginally more comfortable than the chairs. Um, nobody came to check me up every two hours, which must have been La La Land. She was in saying that would happen. Nobody came near me. Um, I didn't go near the trolley because I overheard the security guard when he handed over to the next one. He said, if anybody so much as goes near this, let alone tries to get up on it, you have to remove them from the premises. So, and they patrolled the corridor like I was some danger to, you know, I've never been a danger to myself or others, which is why psych units won't take me because I'm neither psychotic nor suicidal nor homicidal, unless they fill me with drugs like Siroxat, Effects or Lexapro. I don't do well with those kind of drugs, but even then I wouldn't kill anybody or myself. I just would be belligerent. And I did try to explain that to them. I said, I have a mental health condition. It puts me into high level fight or flight. And if I don't, if you don't listen to me and if you can't help me, I can be belligerent. It's nothing personal. I'm awfully sorry if I come across as rude. Um, so for the 10 hours, I tried to sit, I sat sideways in the wheelchair, I tried to exercise my back, I walked a little, um, I tried everything and in the end, I, I could not tolerate any more. I, I, more damage was done to my joints and my spine in the 10 hour wait than any benefit from the treatment I received. There were people in the this it's like it's like Dante's Inferno. There are levels of hell to go through in order to get treatment at Cadden General Hospital through emergency. Um, I never did make it past the trolley stage, although I did get to assessment, acute assessment ward one with five patients in it. When I got in there for two days, but no bathroom. So finally on day three, I said, please, I need a shower or a bath. And a very kind nurse wheeled me to what used to be the day ward. And I had a sit down shower after three days because I asked. <clears throat> um, there, were, there was a woman in a wheelchair in level one, the cabin, of Dante's Inferno, vomiting, or a woman in a wheelchair, vomiting, puking her guts up. It still didn't put her any further up the line. There was a, a woman, at, I, I, I would go out, the one thing I'll give them credit for because it's taking up to 15 hours to get seen, they turn a blind eye to a certain little smoking spot, even though it's a no smoking campus. 
that there was no sandwiches or tea offered. The coffee machine was out of order. Uh, there was no even water offered to the dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people waiting. Uh, there was a 73 year old lady died five minutes after making it to ICU and Stephen Donnelly, I would like you to inquire and that fam lady's family also, how long did that 73 year old wait between arriving at the hospital and dying in ICU? When I was out having a little cigarette, I had time to paint my nails. I did all the tricks I know to deal with my mental health when I'm anxious, painted my nails, you know, couldn't concentrate really on the phone calls. Um, but I did send messages out to uh, some journalists, not for publication, but just in case anything happened to me, to describe what was going on. Um, when I was out on a cigarette break, there was a lady in her probably 50s sobbing and shaking. She had driven from Dublin to visit her 90 year old mother. So maybe she was 60, I don't know. Sobbing and shaking because a month ago when she had come from Dublin to visit her 90 year old mother, she had had no problem. And she obviously had not been made aware that Cavan General was on a lockdown COVID lockdown, and they weren't allowing any visitors. So she was absolutely distraught that she wasn't allowed to see her mother. And I just tried to comfort her. And I, I was just saying to her, look, there'll be a solution. Don't pack, please, please breathe. You know, she was just hyperventilating. So I was sitting there crippled, mostly from the 10 hour wait. I think it was 10 hours before I got put on a trolley, and that was only because I lay in a fetal position in the corridor and another gentleman went so ballistic, not just at me lying down, but at the weight and the state of people that were in acute uh, distress that were not being, they were just being told you have to wait. There's, sorry, it's just the way it is. You have to wait 10, 15 hours, you know, tough. I mean, they didn't say tough, but that was the message. And, and this guy, he was like a cap and football or something. He was wonderful. He was a patient. I mean, he was waiting to be seen, but he finally snapped. It's like when that movie, when you look out the window and you say, I'm not going to take it anymore. And he stormed up and down this corridor full of purse people. It was level two of Dante's Inferno. And uh, he said, this is a shithole of a hospital. This is outrageous. This should not be happening. There are people falling where they sit and there's a woman lying on the floor. This is outrageous. And I think, God love him, I think he went and demanded that something be done. And so very shortly thereafter, a nurse came and said to me on the floor, uh, we have a trolley for you. So they took me to a trolley. I'd, uh, I'd been given no meds in the 10 hours since the first Librium, where I was told I would be checked every two hours. I was detoxing. And the reason I'd gone in was when I tried to detox myself three days earlier at home, the withdrawals were so severe. I was vomiting, I was trembling, I was I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. I was I was like a wounded animal. I felt like I was going to die, and I'm not exaggerating. So anyway, I, I was taken to a trolley, and uh, my blood pressure was taken, and um, I'm not. I, I don't think they took bloods at that point. I didn't actually see a doctor for another at least five hours. So from arriving in an ambulance to being seen by a doctor was approximately 15 hours. Now I've been to St. Vincent's and they have similar, some of the Dublin hospitals have similar, if not longer waiting hours, but it's a little bit more humane and they have bench seats and they turn a blind eye if you have to lie down on a bench seat. I mean, they get junkies and stuff. I'm not a junkie, but I am alcohol dependent. And if I'm in, if I'm active in my addiction, you know, I didn't arrive drunk at all, but I was detoxing unsupervised uh, in a corridor on the second level of Dante's Inferno. So about five hours after getting a trolley, 
a, a doctor came and uh, it was a lady doctor, I think, and she was quite nice. And I said to her, I'm having a nervous breakdown and I'm detoxing from alcohol. Uh, and um, so she said, let me see what we can do. They may have, maybe a few hours later, they took blood, so I don't know. And, um, and then she said, I'll refer you to medical. I don't know why medical. That was where the details would happen. Oh yeah. Then comes a doctor, another doctor, after they'd done my blood tests and for some bizarre reason did the second chest x-ray I'd had in five months. I didn't need a chest x-ray, although I'm a bit, you know, chesty from the experience and I've got a swollen gland. So I don't know, I hope I didn't, I may have picked up a cold. Anyway, and the COVID tested me against my wishes. I said to them, they said, sorry, we're not going to put you on a ward unless you submit to a COVID test. Well, they never did put me on a ward, so I shouldn't have submitted really. Because I stayed for three days in the levels of Dante's Inferno, which is accident and emergency. So if I only needed a COVID test to go up on a ward, with hindsight, I needn't have had it. But anyway, having melted down about that, I went in in advance with a medical power of attorney letter allocating somebody and saying I did not wish ventilation or remdesivir or any drugs that I was not aware of. And that's the point I was going to make. The ciprofloxacin that I was administered there in 2014, which aged me 20 years and disabled me, I'm on permanent disability now. When I finally said it to a consultant on discharge, he said, oh yes, we had about five incidents of that. And when I'd reported it to my GP a couple of years ago, she said, oh yes, I had a patient like that. She suddenly had two broken ankles out of nowhere. But stupidly, I didn't record either of them. And when I said to my GP, would you be kind enough to put that in writing? And she said, no, no. She said, it might've been random, Angela. You might've just had a fall. But a consultant who said that Cavan General Hospital had had at least five incidents of adverse reaction joint failure from ciprofloxacin. He said it in front of two registrars and probably the other patients on the ward heard it. So I hope that Stephen Donnelly will do an audit and that that, that will become evident. How that consultant phrased it was he said, oh yes, yes, we had about five people had allergic reactions to that drug. And I said, excuse me, it's not an allergic reaction. It's a very dangerous drug, which is banned in America and restricted in Ireland. He said, yes, yes, but we call it a, 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 an allergic reaction. So I, I should have challenged it, but I, I did challenge him. You know, again, I didn't record. Um, so that's the ciprofrox inside. <laughs> The triage nurse needs sending to re-education camp. And I mean, she needs sending to, she needs suspending and sending back on a specialized course uh, of treating patients with mental health uh, because she treated me very badly, would not meet my simple request of a trolley despite there being many trolleys available, which I later discovered. And she facilitated an exacerbation of the arthritis and joint issues, a lot of which were incurred at Cavan General in the first instance. So I didn't take her name, but records will show her name and she, she should be suspended and trained, retrained. Um, so they did my bloods, they did, they, they were, they were fairly thorough once they got going, you know, on the trolley in Dante's Inferno. And um, there was more than me in distress. There were people, I literally, it crossed my mind to, to put a call out for Stephen Donnelly and a team to actually helicopter in to Cavan General and see for themselves the war zone. And it's not because of the C word, it's 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 my understanding the reason i'm asking for an audit is start with a financial audit 
I'd like to know A, the budget that Catton General Hospital has, and B, the extra budget allocated for the last two years of the medical incident. And I'd like to know why that money hasn't been spent on more staff and opening up every ward and uh, every bed. Because I'm aware of hospitals where wings are just closed off for lack of staff or lack of funding. So I'm not blaming individual staff, although their morale is very low. Uh, I am saying that the whole hospital, now one person was saying, I think it might have been the gentleman that was finally had enough was saying that this hospital needs is closing down. Well, the last thing we need to do is lose a regional hospital. It's clearly there's a need. There were people in all sorts of emergencies. And if somebody comes in with an emergency, it shouldn't take 15 to 25 hours to get a doctor to attend to them. After day one, and they had assessed my bloods and the various tests they did, they said, oh, you can go home. I said, I beg your pardon. They said, your, your alcohol level is, no, is normal. You, you, you know, we, you, you have a normal level. You don't show up as an alcoholic. And that's the second time that's happened. I once went there before and said, can I have a medical detox because I want to go to rehab and they won't take me without a detox. And they discharged me after a day saying, you're not only alcoholic, you're legal to drive. But I rang my son and I, when they said this to me the second time, trying to discharge me the first day, well, by then it was the second day because it took 15 hours to get seen by a doctor. 20 if you had the second doctor who looked at all my results. Uh, my son said it might be mum because you haven't had a drink for 20 hours. Um, I don't know, or it may be just I built up a tolerance, or it may be just that people were praying for me and a miracle of healing was happening in my body, I don't know. But my son said, don't listen to them mum, tell, insist on the detox. So, so when they were saying they didn't know how to do a medical detox because the guy had gone home for the weekend, I said, please phone him and please ask him the protocol. I said, I can tell you the protocol because I've been here before. I should have a drip, I should have potassium, I should have vitamin B12, C, thiamine, supervision and Librium. I'm telling them how to do their job for God's sake. So they must have either made that phone call or whatever. So they reluctantly agreed to keep me for a three day proper detox. Up until then, I'd only had six Librium when I arrived with the very kind ambulance drivers, Eamon and Colin from Mullingar, who deserve a, a recognition trophy, whatever they are, award. Um, so if I, I think I'd gone through the worst of my detoxing at home where I nearly died and people were praying for me and for whatever reason I was in, I was improving. But if I had been in the state of where near death, which end stage alcoholism can cause, I would have died right there waiting. Uh, there was a, a, I'll tell you as much as I can, and I'm doing this fresh because I'm only discharged yesterday. So I made it to level, you see, the triage was level one. The ambulance was amazing. Triage was level one, Dante's Inferno. The long corridor was level two. I skipped level one because of the kind ambulance drivers. And then I made it to level three, which was a trolley just in a room. And then I made it to level four, Dante's Inferno, which was acute assessment ward one with no bathroom or shower. And, um, but three meals a day and the proper amount of Librium and um, the drip and everything, everything happening. So they obviously did their research and figured out how to do that, but they weren't at all 
aware even with hindsight i should have admitted myself as a mental health patient with a parallel alcohol relapse issue which needed treating but hindsight's a wonderful thing so n n none of them were very aware of the mental health side of did or even bpt or even a nervous breakdown they were it was almost as if they were all trained to treat old people with heart attacks take your blood pressure do your obs um give you whatever meds the doctors said and, and wheel you off for a scan or an x-ray or whatever it might be but everybody was on automatic pilot it was like um it, it was apocalyptic it was like zombieville the occasional nurse or doctor was you could they, they were real there was a lovely male nurse called it was actually called kyle but i misheard him so i kept calling him clive <laughs> He didn't say anything, but he, he was very lovely. He, he was very good at his job, but a bit demoralized. And towards the end of the shift, he would sort of fade away and forget to do things like, say, I was supposed to go to assess acute assessment ward one. He, he forgets some things, but it doesn't matter. Love covers a multitude of sins. Um, the, 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 on my ward, there were four ladies and a man. <coughs> <clears throat> this man was a highlight of my stay. Of course, we all had, we had no television, who cares? But every phone call, people could all hear each other because it's just a little room with five beds in it. And especially this elderly gentleman, because he was a bit deaf, he had to have all his phone calls on speakerphone. <laughs> so funny. So the shop, there were two occasions where he rose up like a boss absolute boss i would estimate he's in his 70s and i overheard on one of his speaker phone calls that he has an all Ireland medal he used to play for cavern town uh, football long ago i don't know 40 50 years ago um but they won an all Ireland medal and he's quite i won't say his last name but his name was sean those who know will know who he is and i think his niece is in charge of new hospital projects like she can click her fingers and get a new hospital project get millions of a budget or billions whatever it costs so he was a very influential man but he'd had a stroke or something and nearly died so he'd been admitted but to the to the ignorant i, I, I don't mean that in a bad way but to the un, unskilled eye he just looked like an old fella who'd had a stroke so the, the shop lady came in with her trolley and she, like she was on automatic pilot they all all the staff ran around too fast and they made no eye contact and they really were just trying to get their job done and get, get the hell out so she came in all she in the shop he said i beg your pardon jonathan in the shop and he says w -w -w what do you mean she said it's a shop do you want anything i've got other wards to see to <laughs> And I'm thinking to myself, this is this legend man who's lived his whole life for Gaelic football, gone to the highest level and got an all iron medal, is respected in his circles, and you're talking to him like a bit of dirt. But he, he took care of it himself. He said, you're very contrary. And she said, what? And he said, do you have a man? Are, are you married? She said, yes. And he said, how does he cope with you? <laughs> and he woke her up out of her dream. <laughs> and she said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She said, it's a shop. I've got like, what would you like? I've got razor blades. I've got chocolate. I've got <laughs> newspapers, magazines. And like, finally, she was civilized to him. And, and he bought a couple of things and so did I. <laughs> and then she left. So he, he dealt with that like that, right, like that. There was another incident where the, the staff, the night staff, I don't know whether it's because they're under pressure or demoralized or just spoiled, right? They, they just do what they've got to do at any time of the night, regardless of patients being asleep or whatever. 
But um, so there was another young nurse who actually knows my son, Katie, gorgeous, gorgeous, lovely nurse. And she took his blood pressure, which had been a real issue. And, um, and she took his blood pressure and it was lower than what it was when he'd been brought in in an ambulance. So he was quite happy. So he said to her, I'm very surprised um, because my, when my daughter took it, it was much higher. And she says, oh, don't worry, I'll check it later. I'll come back and check it again. So he took her as her word. This was about 10 p.m. And he was telling his daughter the next day, or whoever she is, niece, I don't know. He was saying, Jesus, she came back at 10 in the morning and woke me up. <laughs> he said, I can't believe it. He said, I know she said she'd come back, but I wasn't quite prepared for it to be at 2 in the morning. My ears hurt because you could be asleep through the night, very little, an hour here, an hour there. And suddenly a nurse is jamming a temperature thing in your ear and strapping a, a blood pressure thing because it's on their to-do list. You know, some of them might be kind and just touch you and say your name to wake you up. But literally, the one that jammed it in my ear and strapped this on and I'd only got to sleep at five in the morning. And I said, well, what are you doing? She said, oh, I'm taking your arms. What does it look like? I said, well, there's no need to be rude. She said, I'm not being rude. You're just cranky because you've just woken up. She said, make a complaint. See if I care. And again, the cavern footballer in his 70s heard her. And it, he happened to get a, a phone call from a priest, a friend of his, who's probably 80 and retired. But the priest phones while she's being rude to me and ebullient and telling me it's me because I've just woken up. And he, he says to the priest, <laughs> he says, um, I have BHI. And he said, um, but, but an ambulance picked me up. And he said, they've accidentally landed me in Mount Joy. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's not, it's true. And, when, and then the nurse that was being ebullient with me, she heard that because she could hear everything in the wood and she copped herself on. And then, and then as, as he ended the conversation, he said, OK, Father, thank you. You can't visit. We're not allowed visitors, but thanks for phoning. And I went into peals of laughter. I said, not only are you busted to the nurse, I said it was to the parish priest. And she and I just both started laughing so much. And she thanked him. She said, you made my day. Thank you. She didn't apologise, but she thanked him. So there were, it was like, that's why I say it's like the wall. Because I remember my mother describing moments like that where human beings rise up in, in the face of adversity. But the reason I want a financial audit of Kevin General Hospital, please, Mr. Donnelly, the one who I first made a Facebook post on taking the piss out of you saying, don't kill your grannies. And by the way, when Mark Luby came to my house in 2018, I think it was, I made a Facebook video afterwards because I'm not very good at filming it. I find that ambush journalism a little bit a bit old fashioned. But I did make a, a Facebook video about Mark Luby and Jerry Goldrick and three others visit. And it got 27,000 views on Facebook. So when I'm well, I'm very, very well and I'm a semi retired journalist. So I, I'm recovering and the Librium takes a while to get out of my system because I don't abuse drugs and I don't use pharmaceuticals other than in emergencies, like this was an emergency. Trying to think if there were any others. There was another lady crying outside in the little secret spot where we could have a sneaky bag. And she was crying because she'd forgotten to bring a mask and was afraid to go into Dante level one because she had no mask. So I took mine on. I wouldn't wear a mask, but I wore a visor. I didn't have to. I've got emphysema for fuck's sake. I'm under Professor X. Sorry for swearing. I'm under Professor Hayes with COPD and emphysema. Um, you know, Edmund Bernays, look him up, the cigarette expert experiment in MK Ultra, where they got women to walk and smoke, walk, do, do a protest, all smoking cigarettes, in order to promote cigarette smoking. It was a, it was a project. Look that up. So there was hypnosis in, in a lot of children for cigarette addiction. And that's no excuse. I, I, as an adult, I could have chosen to stop and I didn't. But you meet the best people in the cigarette smoking place. So this lady was weeping because she had forgotten her mask. 
So I had agreed reluctantly to wear a visor, which had a blue bit, so it was like a halo. <laughs> but I wore it like a peak cap, because when I wore it over my face, it steamed up and caused a breathing restriction and anxiety. So I just gave her mine. And then she was able to go into Dante level one and, and start from there. She didn't know there were free masks you could get and the masks are more damaging than good anyway. I'm just trying to think, have I missed, her, missed anything? There's the 73 year old lady who died in ICU five minutes after she got in there. Please find out how long she had to wait. If she only, if she was rushed there, like in a normal emergency, that's great. But please check. Uh, there was the girl, poor girl, puking her guts up in a wheelchair. Didn't move her any quicker up the list. There was a, a man turned away who came back with such dogged determination. He came back the next night again, presented himself and went through hell again. So I'm not blaming the staff other than about two of the staff were, well, one was a Nazi, just downright. Imagine instructing a woman in the middle of a nervous breakdown, imagine instruct with injuries sustained to a great part in that hospital who had forewarned and the GP and the ambulance had that she needed a trolley Imagine that triage nurse instructing the security guy if she lies on the floor or climbs on the empty trolley, eject her from the hospital premises, fire her or suspend her. Let's be, let's be kind. Suspend her and re-educate her, please. But other than about two, even the ebullient nurse, I forgive. She just, the night staff need to stop doing their to-do list at whatever time suits them uh, and do it uh, with a bit of compassion for the patients. But it, really the best way, Stephen Donnelly and your work party, if Cat and General doesn't clean their act up because of this video, I doubt they will, it will take a month to get their act together. But what I suspect is the millions upon millions upon millions allocated to that hospital for such an eventuality is not being spent on extra staff or extra beds or staff with courtesy. And there was another patient who actually is, was, it worked there. But she said she had applied for a certain position for which she was not exactly, particularly exactly qualified, but would have very easily just done an extra course, even at her own expense and qualified for it. She was turned down for the job. And what was done is an endless stream of agency staff is being used for the position instead. Agency staff, to my understanding, cost at least three times the paltry salaries that nurses, nurses get. The doctors get plenty, consultants get plenty as far as I can tell. The CEOs, the suits, the men upstairs need their salaries cut in half and the whole place needs checking for brown envelopes. I'm sorry to be so direct, but I'm just requesting and I pray as well that the many other people that, that voiced their horror. Oh, there was one other incident. An elderly gentleman on a walking stick was discharged and I think it was his daughter with him. No nurse came down with them. Normally, I think the nurses only come if it's a newborn baby or something, they'll see you into the car, but no medical person came. And the daughter just said to her dad, just stand for one minute, dad, while I get the car. The car was only a few spaces away. I was sitting and kind of crippled and on Librium, so I wasn't quick enough. But what he did was, instead of standing still as she instructed him, he's possibly got dementia, he's in his 70s, maybe 80s, he kept hobbling with his crutch and he fell over. So it's like, you've, you've been to emergency, you've had your emergency x-rays and treatment or whatever, you're leaving and you fall over. 
for want of good nursing care. The security man could have come and seen it. The security men sit there mostly on the phone, just telling people, oh, well, you've got a 10, 15 hour wait, sorry, that's just the way life is. What's wrong with each time a vulnerable person is discharged, not everybody, but if it's an old man on a crutch, for God's sake, see him into the car safely so he doesn't fall down the curb. Thank God he did. He, 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 he's so sweet. God is so good. It wasn't a catastrophic fall. I've seen my father fall like this many times. He fell on his bottom and his legs went up in the air, but he didn't smack his head on the concrete and he didn't twist awkwardly. I offered to help her lift him, you know, blind, leading the blind, because I felt so bad that I hadn't been able to stop the fall. But I'm a patient. You know, instruct the security guards to see vulnerable people to the car, please. It takes like two minutes. And I'm not litigious, and I'm sure that woman will not sue them for her father falling as he was unsupervised discharged. But it's a nightmare there. It's chaos. And it's not because of the C word. It's because of the wrong distribution of funding. Please look into it. Thank you very much. Normally, I would send this, and I might, to the Anglo South. I've published in that before as just book reviews and stuff when I was raising my kids. I'm tempted to send this to the Anglo South, but in the first instance, I'm just going to release it. I hope I don't get censored and shut down or bullied. Uh, I will make sure if anything happens to me, it will get released, not just to the Anglo South, but the Irish Times and whoever the hell. Whoever the hell else has got the courage to publish what's going on in our hospitals. Where are the billions Mr. Soros or Kissinger allocated to collapse Ireland? Where's the money? Follow the money, people. Thank you very much and God bless. I'll, I'll update on other things soon. Thank you very much. I ask you, Lord Jesus, please protect this video. And please let me get back up to the right people. In Jesus' name, amen. And heal those poor people. Please sort out Captain General.